going to be a short, punchy presentation on diathermy in the GI tract. And first slide. Um, so first thing, it is dangerous. <laughs> I think we need to be uh, conscious that if the patient is feeling uncomfortable, you should really stop because there's going to be a problem. Otherwise, that problem is usually a perforation or a perforation with a bleed. Next slide. Um, you shouldn't act like you need, you know what you're doing. You should actually know what you're doing. So uh, next slide. And if you're not sure what you're doing, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, next slide. So we think about lesions in the colon in two ways. There's either the, the classical pedunculated 1P lesion. Next slide. Or we've got the flatter lesion, which is either a, a, a 2A lesion or an LST. Uh, possibly if it's more heaped, it's a 1S lesion. And we have to think about how we use the diathermy to tackle these two types of lesions. Next slide. And actually, when you think about diathermy and people come on a polypectomy course with myself, they think about the foot pedal. They've either got the, red, the yellow pedal or the blue pedal, and they think very little beyond pressing one of those two pedals. Next slide. When I ask them about which diathermy unit they're using, they often do not know. They don't know the make or the model or the settings. And some man comes and programs it for them for left-sided settings or right-sided settings, and they seem completely comfortable about that. And fortunately for you, they are relatively safe pieces of kit. They are energy generators, and they've got small mi microprocessors. But you really is an incumbent on you to understand how they work. And if you're going to do more advanced practice and you're going to use other techniques, you're going to be able to have to adjust the settings. So a basic knowledge of how they work is very helpful. Next slide, please. Um, first thing to say is the patients don't get shocks anymore. We, they're, they're clever pieces of kit. They've got intrinsic safety factors. Um, so you put the pad on, they don't get shocks. So you don't have to take the earrings out. You don't have to worry about where the metal plate is inside the, the, the pin of the leg because that doesn't heat up with diathermy either. So you can save yourself a lot of chat with the patient um, because these things just don't happen anymore. Next slide. There are two types of energy you can deliver. They're either monopolar or bipolar. Monopolar is what most of you will be using, which is where you put a patient plate on, and you have a snare. And the current tra is transmitted from the generator through the snare, delivers energy to the tissue, and there is a return plate which comes back through the, the plate on the patient and then is then earthed. That is different to bipolar, which you've just seen an example of in the speedboat, and the hemostat forceps are examples of that, where the electricity simply passes between the two plates at the end of the accessory. So it's a much more localized energy, and it tends to be a little bit safer. Next slide. However, the safety of diathermy is entirely on how the person is using it. So even the safest things become dangerous in the wrong hands. And I just want you to think about the layers of the colon, you're wondering why this applies to diathermy. We're about to find out. Next slide. So when you're applying diathermy, you're going to cause some damage to the, the, the layers of the colon. And that, that damage can go as deep as it needs to go. Next slide. So if you go, the deeper you go in the submucosal layer, the larger the vessels. The larger the vessels, the increased risk of bleeding. If you go too deep, you, you broach or you, you cause damage to the muscularis. Um, and then you get a perforation. And we're trying to avoid both of those things. Next slide. So for a small lesion like this, next slide, we do a cold snare, it's dead easy. So the, the first thing you should learn about diathermy is that most, unit, most lesions will come off with cold snaring and you don't need any diathermy. And cold snaring is far safer than hot snaring. So therefore, if you can cold snare, you, you should, and 80% of the lesions are suitable for cold snaring. Next slide. But if you're going to use heat, you need to think about some factors. And the factors are these. The amount of power you deliver, the duration in which you apply that power, and the amount of tissue you have got contained within the device applying the power. And it's usually a snare. OK, so how much snare closure you've got is how much tissue you've grabbed. And you can vary that by either adjusting the dials on the power. The duration is how much time you spend with your foot on the pedal. And the amount of snare you've got is, is how tight it is. Next slide. So most snares will go through a relatively superficial layer of the mucosa, usually SM1 or SM2, if you want to think of it like that. That's why ESD is much more preferable for the deeper lesions, because you go right next to the muscularis. Next slide. But you have to recognize that the diathermy damage in the tissue will be bigger than the actual cut, the margin you cut through. And if you want to know how wide that is, it's the white layer 
that you have after you've done this snare resection. It's the white rim of tissue you've got left. That's where you're gonna get necrosis. Next slide. And obviously if you go very deep, next slide, and you apply a lot of th thermal energy, the, that necrosis can it not just cause a, a post polypectomy syndrome, it could actually damage the muscularis and you end up with a delayed perforation. Next slide. So um, you, can, you need to think about the speed at which you close the snare and also the thickness of the snare, but that's usually less important than the power and the duration. Next slide. So for this sort of lesion, the risk here, next slide, is perforation. So we want to cut through really quickly. So we tend to use the yellow pedal. We do a cut current and we use the uh, submucosal injection to protect the muscularis. Next slide. And we do something called a quick cut. Next slide. That's your yellow pedal and you vaporize the tissue, and because the perforating vessels are close to the surface, they're very thin, you do not get bleeding. Next slide. You will cause bleeding if it's too quick or the energy is not high enough, but the, these machines are set such that after you put your foot on the pedal, if you keep your foot on the pedal, they cycle between a cut and a coagulation current, okay? And the cut current is, uh, regulated by a microprocessor. So you might set the, the yellow pedal to say 120 watts, you rarely use more than 60 or 70 when you're cutting through tissue. And it just di dictates how much energy you want. You very cleverly using uh, resistance, um, uh, recept, um, tr um, I can't remember the electronic word, but it measures the resistance and delivers the amount of energy you want. Next slide. You can Rack it up and you can take the coagulation out and you can have effect one, you get a pure cut and you might get some oozing with this, but obviously you will minimize the damage you get to the muscularis. So depending on how big your resection is, you may wish to change the diathermy setting. Next slide. Um, and you can, have, you, can, uh, you can change the ratio between these using the different settings in most machines. And these are the things that you're probably not familiar with, but they are, uh, you can uh, change these. Next slide. And what you want is this. You want a nice thin rim of white, which is where the diathermy being. You want a nice clear base underneath um, and the polyps obviously can be completely removed. Next slide. If it's too thick like this, you've, two things have happened. You've either gone through too slowly or the energy is too high. And if you haven't been using the yellow pedal, you've been using the blue pedal, that's a coagulation current. It heats the tissue up in a different way. And what happens is you end up with what I call a candle wax appearance. And you have to remember the wider that white, that's a three-dimensional structure, it can also go down. Next slide. So the coagulation goes slower, it vaporizes the tissue and eventually leads to vascular occlusion. So this is the blue pedal we're using. Next slide. And we tend to use it on this sort of thing, a pedaluntic lesion because it's got a big vessel in the middle and we want to seal the vessel when we're cutting off the stalk. Next slide. And the vessel tend to sit right in the middle of the, the, the stalk. So I just want to appeal to the people who use the blue pedal and effectively coagulate the outside of the, the stalk and then switch to the yellow pedal to transect the vessel. That's a bit of a no-no. What you need to use is the blue pedal right the way through to make sure you seal the vessel underneath. Next slide. So for pedunculated polyps, I would encourage you to use the blue pedal. And it's what we call a slow cook. So... If you cut through too slowly, what happens is, is the tissue heats up, it will eventually carbonize. And if you're not transecting the stalk of the polyp quickly enough, that carbon prevents the electrical current from being delivered to the tissue and you get stalling. So that's when you've got your snare closed and the, you say to the nurse, can you close the snare? Or you're trying to close the snare yourself and nothing's happening despite you've got the foot on the pedal. That's because the tissue has carbonized around the snare. And you're in a difficult position here. The, the, the solution is not usually to switch to a higher energy or switch to the yellow pedal. It's usually to disengage and try and clean your snare or move your snare along so you can apply the thermal energy. Therefore, closing your snare becomes desperately important. You need it tight enough to get something called coaptation, and then you need to cut through slow enough to allow the shearing force not to outdo the mechanical, the, uh, shearing force not to outdo the thermal energy which allows the sealing of the vessel. Next slide. Okay, so it will help give you bleed control. I'm gonna, uh, we can pick this up again. I can rattle through a few more. Next slide, uh, but I need to bring it to an end. The last thing I wanna say, it's not just pacemakers you have to be uh, careful about when using diathermy. It's anything that's delivering a pulse. So spinal stimulator, deep brain stimulation. And for pacemakers, it's the intracardiac defibrillating units that are the, are the problem. And you must switch these off if you're going to use diathermy, otherwise you will trip them and then you can injure the product. Next slide. 
The next slide, we'll just cut to the end. So in summary, you should understand your equipment. You should understand what you're trying to achieve with the delivery of the diathermy. And in this, and I haven't spoken specifically on it, that ends up properly the critical step. Safety is absolutely paramount. And if something is wrong, you shouldn't be doing it. So please go away and be familiar with your unit, use it safely, and you will minimize your complications. Thank you.